Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? We pick up today with the third chapter of the book of James, uh, and it really, in a lot of ways, continues on with the subject matter at the end of chapter two, but gets a little bit more specific. Uh, it continues on in the sense that the idea of what it looks like to live as though God does not change like shifting shadows uh, and that he is in charge and that we can trust him and put our lives in his hands, that idea continues, but it gets more specific in terms of the fruit. What is the fruit that we are producing in our life? And it talks specifically now about teaching uh, and the impact that has. And maybe you look at that and say, okay, that part doesn't apply to me. But let me remind you that every single one of us has people in our lives over whom we hold influence and sway. And in one way or another, we are all teachers in that regard. So the idea then in chapter three is to take a look at, at how that's being dealt with in our lives. Take a look at how our words are being used because that reveals what's inside of you and me. And if there's a need for a change in direction so that we have a different impact, that needs to be addressed as well. The culmination of the chapter is that we would have God's wisdom. And always in scripture, having wisdom means seeing God's creation from his perspective, the way he sees it. Uh, that we would have God's wisdom that would lead to increased community and unity and not ruining community and creating disharmony. So there's generally where we're going with chapter three. Uh, let's begin with prayer and we'll get into it. Father, we thank you that you are with us right here and right now. We pray today that your Holy Spirit would create in our hearts fertile soil, that the seed of the word would be planted, that it would take root and grow, and that we then would be blessed with the wisdom that comes from above, that we might uh, better reflect your image and that we might honor you with our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so again, uh, chapter 3 does sort of begin in the same, uh, uh, um, with the same subject matter as chapter 2, but getting more specific, as I said already. Starts out saying, not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers. Why? Because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Words matter. Uh, we bear responsibility for the stewardship of what we say, as well as the stewardship of what we have. Um, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. And who is that? No one. No one except Christ. So there's two things going on in these opening couple of verses. Take seriously what it is that you say. Take it seriously and realize it has an impact. But also rely on God's grace because you and I are going to mess up. And when we do, can our words still be a good witness? Sure they can, by owning that, by recognizing it, by confessing it, not by deflecting, not by making excuses, not by getting angry, but simply by recognizing what has happened and saying, yes, uh, I confess, I have a savior and thanks be to God, I have the victory in him, not in my actions. And by doing that, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're putting yourself in the same position as the people you're interacting with as well. And even then, good and positive teaching can happen because they're going to be in that position as well. But it does begin with recognizing the importance of what comes out of your mouth, doesn't it? And, and we get some examples of that in uh, the verses that follow where James reminds us that there's a certain direction that our words should be leading people and our own hearts and minds in because there is going to be an impact. First of all, verse 3, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So there can be a direction established. As he's talking about our words here, there can be a direction established by our words. Is it a direction that points people to the cross, that points ourselves to the cross, or is it any other direction? There's only one direction that matters. There is no, one, no, no other name, rather, given unto men by which we must be saved, and that is Christ our Savior. So 
Do our words point people in that direction or do they point them anywhere else? Do words matter? Well, one of my favorite analogies to answer that question is uh, the analogy that says our, our words are an awful lot like toothpaste. Once you've squeezed the toothpaste out of the tube, it's really hard to get it back in there again. You really can't. And words have a similar impact. Once they're out there, yes, there can be apologies. Yes, there can be work toward reconciliation. Yes, there can be forgiveness. But they're still out there and there's still hurt that's caused by that in many cases. So the, the first part of, of this is that we need to ask, does there need to be a change in direction? Uh, like a bit in the mouth of a horse changes the horse's direction, like the rudder controls the direction of the ship. Our words tend to show what's happening inside. And does there need to be a change of direction there? Uh, it goes on to say, in verse five, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. The tongue reveals what's going on inside, uh, the, from the sinful human nature. And, and if that's not controlled, the ultimate... Uh, um, outcome is going to be what James writes about here, the whole person being corrupted, the whole course of life set on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. The whole outcome is a direction that is not pleasing to God. I fear this is something we take far too lightly in our Western culture. Uh, we can be forgiven anyway. Oh, everybody does it. You know, we, we start talking the talk of Christian faith and trust in the Lord and how he loves everyone. And then we treat others with such disdain and disrespect. It does show exactly what James writes about in verse 5. It shows a certain arrogance. Making great boasts is the way he puts it. It, it shows that, that oftentimes we act at least as though we think we're just what everybody ought to emulate. They ought to all be like us and then the world would be okay. If you honestly believe that, let me ask you if you want the video screen on your forehead so everyone can see everything you're thinking and feeling all the time. If we're ever in a position where we honestly are acting that way, it's time to go and get some humility. It's time to recognize who we really are and how much Christ has done that we would have life and have the opportunity to live under his grace right here and now. So the idea of a small spark creating a big fire, that's not the outcome we want. We want a change in direction, the example of the horse and the rudder, and we want a different a change in impact, a change in outcome. Uh, and that's the, the spark and the fire. We don't want our words to be burning things down. We want them to be building people, us included, but others especially up. And, and we want to then be reflecting the image of the living God all around us. Is this difficult? You bet it is. Uh, of course it is. Um, and, and that's described in the verses that follow. Verse 7, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And that word restless there is, is really meaning unsettled or unstable. Again, it shows what's going on in the heart. You know, out of the heart come all of these things, the scripture says. Out of the heart come, you know, lying and slander and evil of all sorts. And the tongue is the conduit through which they come out, isn't it? So, does it matter? Yes, it matters. Is it important? Yes, it's important. Not many of you should presume to be teachers. We are all influencers in one area of life or another. And so what we say makes a huge difference. I'm often surprised, and I guess I shouldn't be, but I'm often surprised at how people feel that they have the right to say certain things out in public that they would never say in the church sanctuary. Well, if you wouldn't say it in the church sanctuary, should you be saying it elsewhere? I'm often saddened how people will say things when they can say it anonymously in our digital world, sure creates a, a means for that. They can say it anonymously, so they'll say it, but they would never say it if they had to attach their name to it. Well, if you can't attach your name to it, you probably shouldn't say it. And, and you know, these are just simple, childlike truths. 
but we fall into that trap so easily in our culture and in this day and age. So the tongue being a restless evil full of deadly poison because it betrays what's in the heart. That's the issue that's behind it. If we are people who are unsettled, unstable in the heart, remember that's what restless refers to, then we are not people who are living a life that, that, that is built upon the unchanging character and nature of God. We're just not. That's all there is to it. And yeah, we'll all slip into that trap once in a while, but this cannot be our, our, what's indicative of our life. You know, it should be the exception, not the rule. And when we fall into that trap, repentance, joy that comes from repentance, and remember, repentance means moving in a new direction, not just saying I'm sorry, that needs to be the rule for you and for me. All right, um, verse 9 and following kind of expand and expound upon this in a different way. You know, what's the fruit is the idea. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Notice a couple of times in that paragraph, James pleads with them in a loving way. He pleads with his hearers in a loving way. My brothers, this can't be. My brothers, hear what I'm saying. What's the source? The source is the heart. Uh, and, and if the heart is in the right place, and the chapter is going to culminate and climax with saying, here's how you seek the right place. But if the heart's in the right, or sorry, if the heart's not in the right place, then all kinds of wrong things are going to flow out of that. And the example is, yeah, how can we say one thing, praising our Lord and Father, and at the same time, belittling, cursing, uh, putting down, talking behind the backs of those created in his likeness? He loves them. He died for them. Uh, how can we treat them as though they do not matter? How can we do that? And, and again, this is something that we often don't take very seriously. Oh, that's just the way they are. No. Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 16 and 17 prayed that his followers would have unity like he and the Father had unity. And that's only going to come when we value the community into which we're placed. So even now, when we can't see each other as, as often, uh, we, we can't get together in the same way as is normal, we can still be in community with each other. Uh, if God has put someone on your heart, don't just ask somebody else, well, have you heard from so-and-so? How are they doing? Call them. If God has put them on your heart, he's put them on your heart for a reason. Act on it. Build community. Uh, if somebody does something that is unexpected and you don't understand, Run it through the filter of what you know to be true about them. They don't intend harm. They don't intend to be nasty. Something else is going on there. You know, that's a really important thing for us to do, to, to explain our neighbor's actions in the kindest way, as the Eighth Commandment says. Not just to jump off on the wrong conclusion or, uh, on an angry con or towards an angry conclusion that may be wrong. And and just blow up. You know, there's an awful lot of pretty simple stuff here that we often don't treat seriously enough. Enough, rather. Um, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. This should not be, my brothers. Fresh water and salt water, they don't flow from the same spring. So what's the spring? Is the spring something that's God-pleasing? Is the inside of you and me something that's God-pleasing? Is our heart in the right place or is it not? That's the self-examination question we're being led towards here. What does it look like to live as though God does not change like shifting shadows? Do my actions look like I believe that's true? Do my actions and my attitudes and my words in this chapter look like God is in charge in my life or not? Those are really important questions for every one of us to ask. Um, by their fruit you will recognize them, Jesus said. This isn't just James' idea. It's built upon the words of the Savior. And the chapter concludes with, with leading us towards, okay, how do we deal with this then? If we have any concerns at all, how do we deal with it? Well, 
let's just go towards what James writes here in verse 13 and following. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, his deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Wisdom, biblically, isn't knowing facts. It's not about information. Wisdom, biblically, is seeing the world through God's eyes. Seeing life from God's perspective. Old Testament and New. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know, to see the world His way. That's what James is getting at here too. So this is what we should be pursuing. This is what we should be asking God for. And that's why I keep using phrases like, "Give God, please give us a heart like yours. Help us to see the world your way. It's not just, oh God, this person ticked me off. Help me to deal with it. This person is so annoying. Change them. It's God, change me. Help me to see the world. Help me to be more like Jesus. That's the goal. And so often our prayers are exactly the opposite. Oh God, please do things my way. May you become more like me. That's essentially what we're praying for if we're just asking God to do life our way. Instead, God, give me a heart like yours. Give me your wisdom. And that is going to be something that is, is um, filled up with great humility, as verse 13 says. The humility that comes from wisdom. I'm not God. I don't know everything. I'm not in charge. Uh, I am part of his creation, and, and I need to seek to fit into his creation in the way that he made me. I need to let him be God. Let him be in charge. Let him, his heart, be in me. And that will show. Uh, the, the good life is a life where deeds are done in the humility that comes from wisdom. That's the fruit. You ever met anyone like that? I have. I would love to have a zillion more of them in the world and in my life. People who are genuinely humble before the living God. They are without exception people who listen before they speak, people who are putting the best construction on situations, people who are ready to own it when they sin, and people I love to be around, without exception. In contrast to that, you ever met someone who, who had the ability to turn every situation back towards themselves, every, every anecdote, every comment becomes about them? Uh, people who really don't hear anything you're saying. That's kind of the opposite of what we're talking about here. You know, God's heart and ears and, and, and his whole being is open to hearing you and me. That's the kind of heart that we're pursuing here as well. Um, in contrast, verse 14, but if you harbor, that is, you, you treasure, you protect, you, you want to hang on to bitterness, or sorry, bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts. Do not boast about it or deny the truth. Own it. If you're harboring that, if you are on the top of the heap in your life, recognize it. That is not the wisdom that comes from God. Uh, that is your sinful human nature driving who you are. And that is not going to produce the fruit of faith. It just can't. Okay, and uh, James uses some, some really direct words here. Bitter envy and selfish ambition. Uh, those are obviously uh, descriptions of a person who is thinking about his or herself first and are, are envious if anybody else gets something they want and, and, and you know, they're, they're just pursuing their own desires all the time to the exclusion of, of the things we've been talking about, of taking the time for building relationships with others serving them, putting them first. That is a person who is not living as though God cares for them. That is a person who is not living as though God does not change and he's faithful. That is a person who's living in fear. And that's sad. I'm not saying this in a judgy way. It, it's just sad that people live that way when the living God is waiting to provide them with exactly what they need to live a life that's blessed and happy. And that's what we want to pursue as well. Um, verse, uh, let's see, 15. Such wisdom, in quotes, it's not real wisdom. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. You know, the, the father of lies, 
who wants to drive you towards fear and discord. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. It doesn't build community, it ruins community. Uh, everybody looking out for themselves. You know, follow your heart. Uh, that's one of the mantras of our day, isn't it? Well, if you are in a locked room with a thousand people, every one of them is following their own heart, that's a scary place to be. Because their own heart is going to be driven by selfish ambition, by and large. But if they're following God's heart, that's a great place to be. Because then, then there's community. Uh, and, and that's what the chapter concludes with in verse 17 to the end. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, seeing the world God's way, is first of all pure, then peace-loving. It's going to pursue that. It's considerate. Okay, so it's putting others ahead of uh, oneself, serving. Uh, it's submissive. Oh, we don't like to be submissive, do we? We don't like to, to, to put ourselves at the mercy of others, do we? But submissiveness here starts with being, with submitting to God, with submitting to his word and letting that drive your life. And, and if that makes for some bumps in the road, so be it. Uh, I'm living to show my thanksgiving, gratitude, and trust in the word of the living God who has won my salvation. Uh, that kind of submissiveness, that is, is power under control. That's not weakness. Uh, it's also full of mercy, because we've been shown mercy, and the ultimate result is good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. To be a peacemaker is, is to be all of those things. It's to recognize that, that God is in charge and does not change like shifting shadows. You know, we've been building on that since uh, early in chapter 2. And it really plays into this discussion as well. He does not change. He's got me. He's got my back. How do I show that in my life? And that will mean taking the high road. You know, uh, you could lash out in all kinds of situations, but instead, let's try to be a peacemaker. And as we do that, with the motive of seeking and exhibiting God's wisdom, his way of looking at the world, there's a harvest of righteousness. You know, we are blessed and others are blessed through us. That's the goal of Christian community, uh, that we would work together and be a blessing for each other, reflecting the image of Christ for each other. Uh, the, the scripture puts it in, um, let's see, is it in 1 Peter? Yeah, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, it says, live such good lives among the pagans, the world out there, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. The goal is that people would look at you and I, who are the church, and say, something's going on there, something good. Who is the Lord God they serve? That's to be our goal. Not, what has the church done for me lately? But how can I serve the living God? I pray that's the goal we all share. Uh, that brings us to the end of chapter 3. We'll pick up with chapter 4 and, and talk more about this. And it's, it's building up towards the fact that all of this is, yes, submitting our entire being to the Lord God. Remember, he does not change like shifting shadows. He is faithful. He is kind and merciful. He has won your salvation. Yes, he's holy and just, and he bore what our, our lives deserved, the justice that we deserved. That's how loving he is. Why wouldn't we want to put our lives under his care and control? The struggle with our sinful nature is that we want to play God. We need to recognize that. And we need to consciously take steps to deal with that day by day by day. And in so doing, seek the wisdom of God, seeing the world his way, having his heart in us, and producing the fruit of community, of righteousness of something that the world can look at and say, God is real. God grant that describes us. Until next time, God be with you. Let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you for your unchanging character and nature. and We thank you for your mercy. We need it so desperately, but you've shown it to us in Christ your Son. So help us then to live as people who've been gifted with new life in Jesus. Help us to live that life that seeks your face, that, that uh, asks for your heart to be living in us, and that consciously, day by day and event by event, 
uh, seeks to reflect your character and nature, that others may see our lives and give praise to you. We ask it all in Jesus' own name. Amen. Well, God grant you a blessed week. Everything works better, not when we want more, 
but when there's this gratitude of what he has given us. So look, marriage works best when I am grateful that God gave me my wife. Everybody I meet wants new revelation. I don't know how else to say it but that. Like everybody, they want new revelation. They don't, however, want to be obedient to what they already know. They want what's next. They want, teach me something new, or we could do what you already know, you know? Uh, you growing in truth, hear me, and I'm not talking intellectual understanding. You growing in truth is inseparably connected to you practicing the truth that you know. Like if you've got a moment where you went farther than you ever thought you could go, where you went darker than you ever thought possible, where you felt so dirty and angry and in that moment, Christ cross mind, your mind blameless, holy forever. That is profound. That is profound. He's trying to unpack these reasons for you to violently and lustfully, lustfully pursue Christ at all cost because he's saying if you get all of these things like if you clean up your life and you never struggle again like you never struggle with lust and you never you clean up your life on the outside and make it look like the Christian community says it's supposed to look but you don't get Jesus you've lost who cares so he's going, no, 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 don't let that be the goal. Don't let that be your goal. Don't let your goal be, I'll be a good person or I'll live like this. Or, let the goal be him. Let it be him. So he says, I count it all as rubbish. Those are good things. They're not bad things. They're not evil things. He's just saying they're rubbish next to you. I count them all lost. I'll walk away from all of them if I get you. To live as Christ, to die as gain. This is the message of this letter, that life is lived for him, to him, through him, with him, about him, everything about him. Who am I that the highest king would welcome?